Bom dia a todas e todos. We're going to proceed to start our first lecture by Professor Kenneth Goodman from the Bioethics Institute of the University of Miami. Professor Goodman is the founder and director of the uh, Miller School of Medicine's Institute of Bioethics and Health Policy. Uh, Ken is a very good friend who has been developing this ongoing uh, academic exchange between Miami and PUC. And uh, I myself had the opportunity of doing a, a postdoctoral research term under Professor Goodman's supervision. And uh, for these uh, three lectures, starting today, Professor Goodman is going to be talking about bioethics, medicine, and artificial intelligence. Thank you very much again to be here again. It's a great pleasure to host you once again. Muito obrigado, Anita. Obrigado por esta oportunidade e privilégio. But I'm in English from now on. <laughs> Thank you for your hospitality. Our relationship goes back more than 10 years between PUC and the University of Miami. It's been a collaboration that I think has been fertile. Uh, it has included exchanges, uh, joint projects, and now... Sorry, sorry. Uh, that's it. I move this too. Huh? Which one is that? Yes, sir. All right. We're here, okay. Yes. <laughs> um, we have managed to survive all manner of institutional and global challenges, including COVID. Uh, indeed, COVID was a great opportunity for the ethics community. Uh, uh, like Nita, I'm a philosopher, um, but my main work is in, is in the world of bioethics with special attention to information technology. It's been something I have been interested in for a very long time, including, ah, Rodrigo. I'm going to work the, a bit of my yeah. Sorry about that. No, it's okay, no, I'm good at that. If I don't like him, I won't go on. <laughs> okay. um, that I've been interested in the role of computers in health for a very long time. Uh, now it has become a very, very hot, topic, uh, as well it should be, because these tools of artificial intelligence are changing how we study, how we discover, how we learn, and how we actually conduct our operations uh, in public health, uh, in hospitals, and in biomedical research. Go ahead. Go ahead. Okay. All right. So is it on you? No, it's back to you. No, so right. Yes. I could change my I could change your name. So what I want to do this morning is share a few thoughts with you um, about generally speaking, the challenges that I believe that artificial intelligence tools are posing for us, but with some special regard to neuroethics and brains, because I think that there's a special zone here, a special area of interest and concern that I think, well, I think that our partnership will be a very good uh, 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 mechanism for addressing. So um, I want to begin with, with a model. Uh, this is a quotation. Um, uh, is it okay? Can, I'm gonna leave it there for a second. Yes. What's interesting is it's from 1936. That medics, are there any physicians in the room? Any medical doctors? Are there any philosophers? <laughs> okay, the philosophers are, well, that's good. Scientists? Lawyers? Lawyers. Okay. Um, the, all of these professions and others as well are, are affected by this work. 
this is this is nearly 100 years ago, a Scottish surgeon who, who was expressing either the belief or the sentiment that what happens in here is essential, is necessary and essential for certain kinds of human activities, namely the practice of medicine or surgery. He might be wrong. And that is interesting for our purposes. What we've seen so far in debates about artificial intelligence, and I think this is a good example of how the ethics community immediately contributed to the debate after November of last year uh, with, the, with the, uh, the launch of the large language models that you've heard about. We know they are biased. We know they might not be safe. We know it's hard to see how they work. We don't understand them and people can't explain them very well. We're not sure who is responsible and accountable for them. And at the end of the day, who should be supervising or overseeing or, or trying to make sure that we use them correctly? We know all of this. This is a great story. And I think that our community, the, the ethics community, has done a good job in identifying these issues. However, that has led to many organizations, including some of mine, <coughs> I beg your pardon, producing guidelines and, and best practices. Here are just a few. I worked, um, my, my program in Miami is a WHO, ah, Nita, maybe folks could be a WHO collaborating center in yeah, ethics. That, that there are some others. Uh, we could collaborate on that. That's another possibility. We, we our, our, our collaboration is mm, as many facets, but Miami is a WHO collaborating center. There's only one in the United States and it's in Miami. And I help them work on ethics and governance of artificial intelligence. There are now a hundred of these around the world in different languages. Uh, at the very bottom, you see my web page there. Uh, uh, you can share these later if people want to do that. Uh, that has examples of other policies, laws, some articles on ethics, artificial intelligence, and health. But when you have a lot of guidelines, which ones matter? And people have actually suggested we need guidelines to write guidelines, which is a, a kind of a reductio, but you get the idea. I want to share with you what I have called a hard problem. It's a very hard problem. And I have invented an imaginary artificial intelligence system, the parfait system. No bias, no hallucination or confabulation. It is explainable to everybody's satisfaction. The people who design it are responsible. They are socially responsible computer companies. They're manufactured by corporations dedicated to the common good. This of course is a fantasy, um, but, I, but it's also a thought experiment. They're affordable, they're reliable, they're easy to use, and they are consistently more accurate than humans, than human experts, okay? Now, I want you to imagine computer programs that do diagnoses or in public health will help you identify outbreaks. In the system, they get it right more frequently than humans. They are correct more frequently than humans. The prognostic systems also are correct more frequently than humans, including whether or not you're going to die. Uh, when we talk tomorrow in the hospital, uh, we'll talk a little bit about, about death and dying in the hospital. Mm -hmm. Imagine if you could predict with very high accuracy which patients will survive and which will not. How would you use this information? How would families and patients use this information? In this world, patients in our thought experiment Patients and families use them all the time. Now, 
there's a standard Charles uh, Chuck Friedman is a is a is an informatics scholar. He used to work for the government of the United States. And as people were debating the relationship between humans and computers, this is his um, his relationship. It's not whether humans are better than computers or computers are better than humans. What seems clear is that if you combine them, they're better than humans alone. It's a tool. And when humans use tools, we extend our ability to see, to hear, to feel, to sense. That's why humans use tools and have for hundreds of thousands of years. So that's Friedman's relationship. The human plus the computer is greater than just the human brain. I have a modification of that, which actually poses a question. The picture of the computer, and that's a little computer. That's not a computer, that's a computer, right? We know that's better than the human brain, but we don't know really what it is. It will be better or right, but what kind of thing, what kind of processes, what kind of diagnoses, predictions, analyses will it be able to do? And that, I think, is a very exciting opportunity for our communities, for the philosophy community, for the ethics community, for the science community, for the medical community to debate and discuss, because the world is now changing very, very quickly. This matters, for example, at Poop, uh, there has been brain research here for how many years, Nita? Uh, Oh, 20 years. Uh, it is an international center for that right. uh, in terms of bioethics, an international center. Uh, our responsibility when you have this kind of experience, I think, increases, uh, which is why I'm very excited by the idea of, of continuing and broadening our collaboration. Okay. Uh, I, uh, that's a, uh, we don't know what that's going to look like. I want you to imagine the clinical use of, neuro, for, uh, of computers, of very, very sophisticated computers for the management of neurologic disorders. Right now, uh, I, I have a friend who's a neurologist um, who said famously, none of my patients get better. They never, I can slow down how bad they're getting worse but I have no cures to speak of. Neurologic science is still growing. But imagine the computers, powerful computers, are able to help us do a better job managing that okay, without biological intervention. So now I'm not talking about uh, implanting electrodes in brains. We'll talk about that later. I'm talking simply about diagnostic uh, uh, insight and analytical expertise where a computer augments the human brain and enables our colleagues in neuroscience to do a better job and to design more interesting science and more interesting studies. Now I want you to imagine artificial intelligence mediated neurologic enhancement, once again, without biological intervention. In other words, uh, um, how many of you have a telephone that has a translator on it? I've been, I've been all the time. I, 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 uh, I'm learning Portuguese on my telephone, right? The translator, when, before I returned to Miami, uh, my job, I was a philosopher who did formal semantics and I had a job in Carnegie Mellon University in Pittsburgh at 30, well, many years ago, uh, in, in the Center for Machine Translation. It was an early attempt at natural language processing to translate languages. And we had big computers and uh, I, they were studying um, Japanese. And it would take a very long time to analyze an utterance or a text to translate it and then to produce the output. And it required a huge computer. We now have these on our phones. What if it's possible through various kinds of, of interventions that once again, do not require 
uh, a medical intervention. You're not, you're not sticking anything in my head, but you are able to enhance the abilities of ordinary people. That's an interesting challenge and an interesting problem. Yeah, carry on, carry on. Okay. Our video, good. No, it's, uh... um, and I think that is another opportunity for us. Uh, in the clinical setting, imagine now neurologic diagnoses and prognoses, including predictions of a patient or a human's future cognitive capacity. This matters a great deal in the hospital because if I become incapacitated, then my brother here must <laughs> consent for my treatment or refuse treatment if he believes I would not want it. That, I think, is going to change everything about, we op about the way we operate in hospitals. Okay. Nope, wrong one. So, is this good news or is this bad news? I want to think a little more broadly about, about, I want to do that if I may, is that okay? Let's remember how these systems work. The parfait system, basically in the future, because it's so good and everyone trusts it, will be used to guide diagnoses and prognoses which will then become part of the data set that the system uses in the future. The future systems are therefore trained on data and information that is derived from practice that itself was guided by computers. And that information is then used to train new algorithms and new systems. Sooner or later, the automatic replacement of everything we believe we know will have been mediated by an intelligent machine. Right now, if you look at the hospital records, it's doctors and nurses notes, which are very hard to read, by the way. Um, but it's all human and flawed. But manage now, imagine now in 10 years or 20 years where those doctors start asking the computers for advice and start following the advice, which then will be documented in the record, which will be used for future diagnoses and prognoses. So in the future, all of our data and information will be shaped by computers. It's not only or simply that computers will be analyzing our information, they will be, become the only source of our information. That I think is a very interesting challenge. Now, the ethics part of this I think is, is, is well, it's what we do, but better than humans is usually a good thing because humans and tools are better than humans without tools. Uh, humans are imperfect, we, even with these tools, sometimes because of the humans. And the more we look, we find more uncertainty and sometimes even error. So here, for example, from the last month or two months ago, uh, examples of, science, of studies showing contradictory results about large language model text generating programs. In other words, we today do not know the best system. We don't know how they work very well. And we do not know how they compare with each other, which by the way, is a wonderful area for, for biomedical research. Uh, we, are, we are adopting these tools at my institution, um, at the University of Miami Hospital. Hmm. Or Tanera Ferreira. Uh, a graduate of this institution is the chief medical officer. Uh, one of the reasons I have great sentiment, and we have sentiment, is that my boss is from Puerto Alegre uh, in Miami. 
Um, our hospitals are uh, across the world are now adopting these systems for various purposes. In some cases now for, for managing, uh, managing records and managing physician inboxes. Uh -huh. um, in other cases for generating messages to patients. I share with you here, very recently, we don't have enough research, I don't believe, on any of these systems yet. And in fact, we're, at, we're adopting these systems without the kind of comparisons that we would normally require. Uh, and that is a feature of electronic health records or electronic medical records. We adopt them because we need to adopt them and we sometimes do so before we understand them completely. The boss comes and says, here's, Tanira is, is very good about this, by the way. Uh, so it's not about the University of Miami, it's about the world. We adopt these systems without having understood completely and clearly how they work and how they document our practice. So is it perfect? Not yet. Uh, I wanna share a few other thoughts, some of which bear on, on social responsibility. Um, how do you say scraping in, in scraping the internet? The, the constant gathering and gathering of information automatically. Explore them. In Portuguese, we use exploring. Okay. Yeah. But uh, the English scraping is is you is is like with a with a with a tool. Yeah? Okay. Discuss that. But you only get the surface. That this is similar to the problem in biostatistics on that uncertainty. Are there any biostatisticians here? <laughs> in biostatistics, one of the greatest problems we face is called missingness, which sounds like a metaphysical concept, right? We have to study what is missing. Oh, it's Heideggerian. Yeah. It's nothingness. <laughs> In any case, um, and that is a problem because we continue to, to need to analyze these data. And as, as we know, and, this, and the philosophers will appreciate this, and going back to David Hume, we've had a challenge related to when we see patterns in data, are we identifying a causal relationship or simply a, a correlation, a constant conjunction, as, as Hume put it. And these were the early prognostic scoring systems. They would see a pattern. In fact, machine learning used to be called knowledge discovery in databases. You would look for patterns in a database. Oh, here's a philosophical trick. I'm gonna do a trick now. This is from, um, from Wittgenstein actually. So I'm going to share with you a series of positive integers and you are going to complete the series, right? Two, four, six, eight, no, it's 11. Right. What's the series? Can I write on this? No. Yes. Can I really? Yeah. I can yes, you can, the problem is I am here. Oh yeah, there's a marker, it's okay? Right. Yes, go ahead. It's okay right here. Yeah. What is the pattern? It looked like it was increased by two. Well, my pattern was you increase by two, one, two, three times, and then by three. Uh -huh. Maybe then. In other words, you don't know the rule. Well, when do you know the rule? Right? Mm -hmm. It could be two, four, six, eight, one million, one in ten thousand, two hundred fifty-six, and that would be a legitimate number in the sequence if you knew the sequence, which you can't find in the database when you're simply looking for patterns. Uh, I think this is a very interesting philosophical challenge. 
The social problems that I want to address on top of that are that we humans are greedy, selfish, lazy, inattentive, and sometimes mean to each other. So how is the internet coded? It's coded in by people in digital sweatshops around the world. This is from the Philippines. Are they being paid by a Microsoft salary or a Google salary? No, they're being paid very little. They're being exploited to tag the internet for large corporations to gather information to build the systems that we are all now completely dependent on. I don't, I don't, mm, this, this is a free enterprise, yes? All right. <laughs> And in the future, we won't even need people. Uh, right now, I have read where, where the, the, the number of features of a concept, the way you tag it, there can be, there, there can be as many as one trillion. Mm -hmm. But sooner or later, computers will be able to do this and we won't even need people anymore. Uh, and I'm sure we'll use that for the common good and the advancement of civilization and humanity, right? <laughs> well, so in the United States, uh, we have we still have a very large problem with um, substance abuse and opioid addiction. And so people would use uh, pharmaceutical opioids and become habituated. This is a major problem in the United States. Why? many reasons, but one of them was this. In the electronic health record, where all this information is being gathered for clinical systems and prognostic systems, when sir, the, the, one of the, the company that manufactured um, OxyContin, is that, what, what is the name of an opioid? Yeah? OxyContin. OxyContin would have recommendations to physicians in the electronic health record to prescribe the drug whenever I complained about pain. In other words, there was a secret financial relationship so that every time a physician prescribed OxyContin, she received extra money. This was a criminal enterprise and the government, the Department of Justice, which is now the same organization prosecuting Trump, uh, <laughs> Uh, basically said, this is not acceptable. That's a violation of federal law and gives everyone a conflict of interest. And they paid a $145 million, which I think is a lot of money. My mentor and colleague, a physician named Randy Miller, um, described what he called the standard model. Um, he would say, he was, a, he was internal medicine, I met him in Pittsburgh, and he would say the computer should no more replace this than this. He would hold up his stethoscope. The stethoscope is a tool. It helps him hear better. The computer helps us think better, but it does not yet replace the human brain. In any case, in our world, humans are educated and licensed to practice medicine and nursing. And that humans are better at using tools than all, so far than allowing themselves to be used by tools. Um, uh, the science fiction here is very exciting. Uh, and that the, uh, the Nazi robots, when they take over the world, if they haven't already, uh, are going to be controlling us. That's interesting speculation. I think if we get the practical uses right now with appropriate governance models and laws, we don't need to worry about Nazi robots taking over the world. That the computer should no more replace human cognitive practice than, as, that as Miller says, the stethoscope with certain variations. The stethoscope is simple. The computer is much more complex. And so we've come up with the idea that we, uh, it, it, I think this is an interesting, it's, I don't know if this is a conservative idea or not. I think it might be. We are now dependent on computers. 
we know that computers are imperfect for many reasons, including some that are our responsibility. It can be blameworthy not to use a tool that improves the care of patients. This is a very important point. Earlier, if it gives a diagnosis or a prognosis that is more accurate than a human, why would you not use it? If it's me in the hospital, I want you to cure me. I want you to save me. And if a computer will help you, then it becomes blameworthy not to use this tool. That tension, I think, is delicious. It is an exquisite tension. It is why we have jobs. All this technology, and at the end of the day, uh, I'm of the view that philosophers need to contribute to these debates. There is no easy answer here. Progressive caution is just the idea that wise and compassionate use of technology and therefore progress can ethically optimize the adoption of computational aids in healthcare and everywhere else. It could be transportation, could be the environment, could be law enforcement. Did you read about uh, the artificial intelligence and the autonomous weapons systems. They're building robots now, battlefield robots that have a vision system, sensors, satellite connections, and guns, really big guns. Are we okay with them deciding when to shoot the gun. Humans get this wrong all the time. When we shoot the wrong people in war, sometimes not in war. This is a hard problem. Uh, but the point, of course, is I'm, I'm just uh, celebrating the role of philosophers in all of this. The idea, autonomous medical systems. So it turns out that NASA, the space agency, is interested in computer robots in outer space. If you don't have a doctor or a nurse, what's the next best thing? So I want to revisit our hard problem. Um, we, we, we are, we have, uh, we're okay for Midnight. time? Midnight? <laughs> I'm very slow, you know, I got, I got, I want as much time to have a silver animation. I am worried, and I, this concern or worry might be sentimental as opposed to analytical, but I am worried about human skill degradation. The human medics today do not know how to do things that human medics 50 years ago knew how to do. Does that matter? Um, in Science Magazine last month was an article about surgical robots. Now they have these now, and the main job of these robots is to, to cancel my, my hand when, when the surgeon is cutting, right? It takes this and makes it perfectly steady. See how steady my hand is? It's uh, an old, uh, it's Mel Brooks. Oh, yeah. <laughs> See how steady my hand is? Uh, they are developing now flexible probes that will be able with cameras and a, and a machine understanding of anatomy to make an incision to find its way where it needs to go and to be able to do a cert to, to, to remove a humor, to, co to, 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 to collect, correct something, to anastomose something in the, in the human gut. The, the robots now help humans be steady. Might the robots in the future 
not need a human at all. And if you were the human and the literature showed that the robots have fewer complications and higher survival rates, do you want a human or do you want a robot to do your procedure? And so the problem of skill degradation, I think, is a very, very large problem. In other words, what if the loss of human cognitive engagement, and think about this, especially in terms of neuroethics, leads to better outcomes forever? What then becomes the role of the human being in this process? What if our electronic health records I apologize for this acronym, uh, electronic health records in English, are wholly, completely replaced by data and information generated by ever reduced or ever diminished human decisions. And that's a restatement of the earlier problem. Our databases are good, large, accurate, and contain nothing that a human did alone. Does this matter? And if so, why? Now, I've described the picture. I, I don't know that I accept that picture or not. I'm, I think we need to anticipate it. I think the science is changing so rapidly. And these computational tools are getting so good so quickly. In the last year, this, this, the, last, the last year will be seen as a very important year in the history of the evolution of technology. Our students are using chat GPT to write term papers. Uh, as I pointed out, they're using them to write notes now in hospital records for physicians. They're being used to write articles in journals. They can take exams. We are just beginning to think about an increase that is changing everything very quickly. And so the question is now also, if they're so good, are we humans going to do a better job sharing with other populations the benefits of this technology? I can tell you one of our, our, our colleagues in Africa, for example, um, are very interested in some countries in Africa where there are no physicians and nurses and there won't be any for the next quarter century. Would this tool help them? Maybe. Will we make it available to them for free with appropriate analysis and review? In other words, are, we've already in many countries around the world mostly North Americans and Europeans um, uh, uh, in Africa and in some places in Central and South America have a history of human subjects research that is terrible. In North America and in Europe internally also, uh, this is the history of human subjects research, right? Are we going to share these new improved tools better than we have shared the burden and the benefits of research. This is why, this is why for example, Brazil uh, was a leading country uh, in the early days of HIV when the drugs were starting to get really good. What Brazil said to its credit was, we have a problem with HIV AIDS. Your drugs are very expensive. We're going to make our own copies of them. In other words, human life is more valuable than your patent protection or your intellectual property. And the drug companies had no good argument for that. I don't mind drug companies. I don't mind people doing science and making money, I suppose. But when it's a life or death matter, life matters more than intellectual property. There will still be ways to make money. That's okay. But we will not, we should not allow, especially since the research occurred in South America and in Africa, to have the countries that contributed to the science not receive the benefits of the science. 
And so apropos our picture, are poor people in the Philippines going to benefit from artificial intelligence that was based on tagging by people in internet cafes in Manila? I think there's a global justice challenge that we face. Um, and we just don't have a good track record. Right, here's an opportunity. If all these tech uh, bros, uh, as we call them in English, get it right, there's plenty of money. You'll make plenty of money. Now you can also have an opportunity to do the right thing in terms of human justice and growth and development. I don't think that should be controversial. Right? Plenty of money and you get to do the right thing. That's beautiful, right? So apropos our collaborations, apropos what I think are ways moving forward that our communities uh, internationally can continue to do this work. If applied ethics is going to be useful, this is our moment for, for innovative problem solving on a challenge that involves obviously in healthcare, public health, biomedical research, and everywhere else. And we have an opportunity to contribute to, uh, I forgot, uh, finance and business and the stock market. What happens when the robots know how to make money? Has anybody tried this yet? I don't know much. I'm, I don't know how to make money very well. <laughs> um, I, uh, in fact, I'm, 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 I'm very bad at it, um, which is a good thing, I think. Yeah. <laughs> but if I could tell you, make me $1 million, Here's one dollar. You know, I give it. I give it. And how much you give it? Maybe it could continue rapidly to invest it by gathering data straight from everywhere. And I come back. I give it a hundred dollars. I come back. I have two hundred, or five hundred, a thousand. Should that be regulated? Anyway, that's that's finance about which I know. <laughs> Ethics workers need to learn about neurology. Neurology. It's a new a new profession neurology and computing, um, that um, one of the challenges that we face is that while you and I and others have learned some science, we need to ensure that philosophers are able to have this conversation. Um, more philosophers need to be comfortable in a computer science lab and in the hospital. And we need them to be able to look at code, computer code, Contracts, business contracts, the, the way the tools work, the way the electronic health records work. For example, one of the, one of the, uh, the contracts now for electronic health records in hospitals require strict confidentiality in reporting problems. Well, hang on a second. If you and I work at the hospital, and I see the, the problem, the, the computer's making a problem or the way it was coded, there's a mistake. It, it keeps putting, uh, it changes kilograms to pounds or something or other. Hmm. Under these contracts, I'm not allowed to tell you and you're in the same hospital. I must report to headquarters who will then send a message. This goes against thousands of years of health professionals communicating directly with each other. So some of these contracts from the vendors of electronic health records, these are all very large proprietary machines are a challenge. And it requires more education, uh, good education. I think one of the things that we can do part of our collaboration um, is is uh, is developing educational programs. So Sergio has just finished a course on AI in Spanish. I think we should do one in Portuguese. Mm -hmm. I think it's a real opportunity. At the end of the day, we're teachers. Uh, I my my delusions that I will change the world are are over. Now I simply want to be a, a good teacher. But if we can teach applied ethics to people building artificial intelligence machines. That may be that may be good enough for now, right? Here is our job going forward. We need to do more research uh, of the sort we're not doing now, comparing the outcomes of different kinds of systems. You know of Chat GPT, but there are dozens of these. 
Have we done comparisons? The answer is not enough, not in a hospital, not in a public health context, not in the neuroscience context, right? Where human cognition, that the human brain is different as you know, than all the others. And what happens in it matters for our purposes, at least more than kidneys or livers or hearts. It, we, we can make artificial hearts and kidneys, and we do. The artificial brain, whether we can make one or not, is going to be the tool that helps us work with and repair and augment or improve human brains. Uh, I suggest we have special teams in our institutions that do this, that have neuroscience capacity. They can manage these challenges related to, to intellectual property. Which again, a lot of these systems are proprietary. Um, uh, I think the Brazilian standard is the right one when it comes to a life-saving drug. But will but will will the BRICS collaboration? Uh, India too said the same thing as Brazil, uh, and and I think that was correct. We're not going to let our citizens die because we can't pay the price for the drug which you developed by research on our citizens. I mean, it's not even ethically complicated. However, there are some legitimate intellectual property issues and somehow or other, we need to, we need to, we need to manage them better. The same with privacy. Very often people will say this artificial intelligence raises great privacy issues. It does. I've saved it till the end because I think that privacy and security are actually, except for, for criminals and bad actors, under control, that laws in most countries are pretty strict, and that is a good thing. Um, I, I, uh, we can have a, meta a debate about whether I own my information. I don't believe anybody owns information or data. That's a metaphor. So if there's a lawyer here, uh, the very idea of intellectual property uses property as a metaphor. If this is my pen, it's my pen. If you take it from me, you've stolen my pen and I don't have a pen anymore. But if I have an idea and you take my idea, I still have it. So what kind of property is that, that I have it even after it is taken? And I think the proper stance there is not of ownership, but of control. If it's my health information, I should be the one to control it. But I don't think that saying I own it is helpful. That may be a topic for another day. International privacy regulations. So we shall have a collaboration convened here jointly between our institutions on international uh, privacy. Right. Huh? That's a good idea. That's right. Okay. And, and and you have and we'll have a we'll have a a a a, 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 a bake sale. We'll we'll bake uh, uh, biscuits to raise funds. It's going to require that we share these technologies better. Uh, that what that in applied ethics, we need to do a better job sharing. There's plenty of money to be made, but we need to make sure that those that ha don't have these resources will not be left behind again. Once again, I do not mind great creative people benefiting from their ideas, but it cannot be exclusive the way it has been. Uh, right now, the largest lawsuit in the United States of America is against Google. And, and, you, and do you know who is testifying against Google? Microsoft, saying that Google is too powerful and has too much information. Microsoft, what a very strange world we are in. But these giants, they give, a, they give us wonderful gadgets. I'm, I'm really happy for Microsoft and Google and all of this stuff. However, they've made enough money. The, the social responsibility, corporate social responsibility. You know, you talk to people in the business community because what, what, what good capitalists will tell you is we have social responsibility in addition to making money. 
I think that's probably right. And then we will broaden finally the remit, the, uh, the, the responsibility of our hospital ethics services. We can talk a little bit about, about more about that tomorrow. Uh, this can be done with standards. Uh, and here's just a list of standards. I, I think that, that we can have local standards. I think local standards are good. It reminds people that there are people locally in leading institutions like PUC and, and elsewhere, that we have scholars who are thinking about these issues and want to contribute to institutional governance. That I'm a philosopher, and yet I'm also responsible at my institution for the ethics service. I write notes in the electronic health record, and my colleagues actually read them, and they base their patient care based on my note. I, I'm a philosopher, and I'm writing notes in the chart, and medics are, are making decisions. This is, this is something that I think is not unusual, but it signals that the community of people collaborating to ensure the appropriate use of this technology is really useful to our institutions. This is not a hypothetical. This is not an abstract concept. This is applied ethics with real standards. Uh, HL7 stands for Health Level 7, uh, International Standards Organization is ISO. Institute for Electrical and, and, uh, Engineers is another. These are international organizations. We need to become familiar with these documents and they will help us, I think, do a better job uh, in, our, in our various efforts. With obrigado, thank you so very much for including me and for the opportunity to continue our collaboration between Pokes and the University of Miami. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ken. Now we still have enough time for uh, questions from the floor. Uh, so while you think about some uh, questions and comments to bring to uh, Professor Goodman, let me start with a very quick uh, question uh, regarding uh, brain-machine interaction. Of course, when we hear about some uh, apocalyptic scenario, usually people are thinking about strong AI or super intelligence, uh, even uh, you know, apocalyptic scenarios, which are not yet present now. I understood that we were talking about uh, brain machine uh, interaction in a very realistic way. You have a supervision uh, by humans. Now, uh, how would you respond to this uh, whole uh, questions and, uh, and uh, you know, uh, apprehensiveness about the future of, uh, of things that could run out of control, especially when uh, people think that super intelligence or strong AI could lead us towards non-supervised uh, AI systems, if uh, I understood you correctly, uh, the major point here is that bioethics and uh, AI ethics uh, committees and documents, recommendations, et cetera, would emphasize the role in the presence of humans. So how would you respond then to people who are precisely saying that, you know, you cannot take for granted that uh, you have this uh, human presence all the time. Thank you. Well, that's a, a good and difficult question. In the, the science coming out of machine brain interaction is really exciting. Um, we are increasingly able, sometimes with interventions, the placement of, of electrodes in the brain, to actually have people with motor neuro disabilities, people with various forms of movement disorders, move limbs and communicate. This is extraordinary science and it is evolving very, very quickly. If there's an artificial intelligence program that can help with that and augment that, then what does human supervision even look like? I'm the, I'm the human who's using this in order to communicate 
artificially perhaps, in order to move perhaps my legs, right? In order, in order in, uh, that, that what our science is now teaching us is that this is, this is ultimately the, this will be a great, great uh, uh, challenge for the mind-body problem. What if it turns out that all mental events are physical events and we can replicate them? Or replicate them well enough? Uh, this is an ancient problem as the philosophers will recognize. But, but your challenge is, is a very important one because we are driven in the parfait model. If this can help a human being, why would you stop it? And the answer is, well, we don't have good enough supervision. If I have a, if I have a paralysis or I have a cognitive injury or if I have a motor neuron disorder, I don't care about your governance. I want to move and I want to communicate. And so we have to think of supervision and governance at a, at a different level. It'll be in the, in, the, in the development of the systems. It'll be in interacting with me. Um, the robots, the super intelligent machines, when they take over the world, I, the, 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 it, it might be with somebody who has amyotrophic lateral sclerosis. It'll be somebody who needed a computer to help and they have augmented her intelligence in ways that, that uh, right? It, it won't be a super human uh, super intelligence. It'll be a human that we've made super intelligent or classes of them. So if you follow the news, I, I try to read the news I don't want Elon Musk <laughs> to be the one doing this. He's, he, he thinks this is interesting and cool, <laughs> and it is. But can you imagine somebody like Elon Musk controlling the way a, a computer will give a human additional powers, not just of movement, but also of cognition? You, you, when you fantasize about this, everything you see in the world is being processed now by your brain. You're make, you are constantly making predictions. You are anticipating the next word that I will say. Uh, machines can do that a lot more quickly than you can or I can. And so when it's connected to that database, which is the internet, constantly putting it into my thoughts or into yours, that's, that's, that's what the robot rulers are going to look like. They will be human beings who are super intelligent unless we decide to, one, it won't be fair Two, it will once again discriminate against minority populations and lower socioeconomic populations. You, you, on my home planet, we're, we're not racist anymore, but you humans still have a problem with this. And that in some countries uh, or in some states, I'm in Florida, which is a very peculiar place uh, when it comes to some of this, um, that the social and political challenges that associate with this are going to be really important. Uh, and, I, and I think the more of these conversations we have internationally, the more important it is. Um, that's a, that's a, you asked a very large and difficult question, and that's just a, 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 a small beginning to answer it. Thank you. Professor Camila Barbosa. Thank you, Professor Bruno, for this brilliant talk. Uh, I was uh, thinking about uh, your mentioning your talk uh, about that we have a global justice problem. And I think that was, uh, I kept thinking that that's the case we are dealing with ethics and I and this application, at the end of the day, we are discussing about justice and this uh, and how we, we apply to this new reality, these new, this new technologies. Uh, but the, the thing that I was thinking about is that can we still think about it globally? I, I mean, it's a global uh, justice issue because it's globalized problem. But what I mean is that 
while we were talking uh, about, for instance, how philosophers should be educated to deal with computer science, to understand it, I was wondering, all right, but thinking about how uh, uh, resources are distributed in uh, Brazil, uh, we don't have uh, enough money to have good computers in our building, for instance. We have very slow old computer. Uh, and also, uh, I think we deal with different problems regarding technology depend in which country and with uh, area of the world we are in. So is there a really uh, global uh, justice or we need also to compare how uh, different parts of the world have, uh, have, be, have been dealing with different problems? I think we're, we're not in the same position to what ethical issues we are in. And that uh, sometimes I, I, I wonder if we still keep talking in a global justice issue. We will lose the sight of what is really missing in a specific place. So how would you if it's globally but locally issue? Wow. That is a wonderful question. Um, I, in, in, look, all of our countries have terrible disparities. In the United States, there are a lot of very poor people. How can the United States have very poor people? How can Brazil, which manufactures computers, which manufactures airplanes, which is a major industrial country, why are your computers in your airport? Why? And the answers to that are really complicated. How in the United States of America are there children who are hungry? Mm -hmm. A lot of them. How did this happen? And the, the, the overarching concern that I have is we didn't get it right with energy. We didn't get it right with food. We didn't get it right with housing. We humans internally and globally consistently make the same mistake. And now we're going to do it with computers. Now, it might be that computers will help in some domains, like in Sub-Saharan Africa. Brazil and the United States are complicated because you have highly industrialized countries with very high levels of poverty. And, 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 and some of this is politics, some of this is technology. Um, I, I worry that the computer technology might be advanced in in, uh, in in a in a ghetto in Miami or a favela in in Brazil, what if a robot or a computer can reduce the incidence of influenza and um, diabetes? And it does. And now we have a computer, uh, maybe in the clinic. Uh, maybe it's one of those computers I described. You walk in, it recognizes your voice, it tells you to do this, it tells me, one, change your diet, two, start exercising, three, all the things. Are... Are a community going to be well served by that? Maybe they need doctors and nurses. And what we've given them is something not as good, unless, of course, it is as good. That's a hard problem. That's the point about if a tool can help you, then do you not have a duty to use it? And response to, and my our response can be, yeah, but we don't want using it to create another level of problems. The way, for example, um, I don't, I don't, I'm not an engineer. I don't know about electric cars. I have a car, you have a car, everyone has a car and they're dirty and they pollute. So I think, well, an electric car would be a good idea. But now we have a problem with batteries and the environmental consequence of a lithium battery, which is worse. I don't know. 
Well, I don't know about recycling either. We can't even figure out recycling on Earth. I've got a paper bag that got that's a little dirty. Got some or a pizza box. Can I recycle that? Can I cut part of it out? Is it going really to be? So in ways where ordinary people, by the way, I'm also the I flew here on from Miami on a big flying machine, a big dirty airplane, not a carbon. And yet last night in my in my room, I was very careful to put the water bottle in a recycling container. Not getting this right at, at the granularity that we need to get it right. And your question about global justice is, is one that I, I think that we, we need to continue to work on. Well, the, the, the greatest moral challenge that the world faces is there's still too many people who don't have adequate education, food, shelter, and opportunities for education. It's 10,000 years of human civilization. And in my country, there's still people who don't have houses, don't have food, don't go to school. And it's not because they don't want to. It's because my society has failed them. Your society has failed poor people here. In France, they fail people. In Russia, they have. In China, they have failed people. It's not, right? This is a universal problem. We humans keep failing each other. Now, I don't know what way to fix that is, but your challenge is a really important one. And we need to be thinking about it on a regular basis. But thank you for the question. Well, I was only talking about the best in Portuguese. You may ask questions in Portuguese. Can I make a follow up question? Yes, sure. think, uh, so, I, I, my second question that I, I, I was thinking about it, and you mentioned again uh, in your response. Uh, I think that we are still dealing with responsibility at an individual level. When you throw the bottle of water in the right container, we are still uh, assuming our responsibility. I think one of the problems with uh, IETICS is that where the responsibility are. It's for the nurses, the doctor applying, is at the company who are building, is with the government we, uh, that are regulated. I mean, I think that we, I, I always uh, kept thinking about who has the responsibility for this kind of technology. And I think that maybe how we distribute uh, responsibility might be one of the issues we, we have to deal because I, I think that politically, we have a, a long tradition of individual responsibility. And with this new technology, is a responsibility to be uh, applied to the tools <laughs> or, or who has it, right? And, and, and as a corollary to your question, which is the most important one of all, if one answer that I want to give is the people who design the systems and write the code, the people who manufacture them, people that sell them, the people that buy them, the people who use them, the people who are, who are using them, which include patients now right, in medicine. And my fear that your question illuminates is, I, am, I want to say that everyone is responsible but I'm really worried that when you say everyone's responsible, then no one takes responsibility. And that I think is a great challenge. It's also easy for me, so I'm putting the, the, the bottle in the container. When I'm home, in the middle of, of, of kitchen, a kitchen roll of paper towels in a kitchen, there's a cardboard tube. In a toilet roll, there's a cardboard tube there. I recycle those. I will take the cardboard tube, I'll cut it like this, make it flat, and recycle it with the other cardboard. And then I'm going to get on an airplane and fly from Miami to Sao Paulo. Am I a hypocrite? Or am I, or is it, or is, or, 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 
or, or what? I mean, individual responsibility matters a great deal. And, and, I, and I go to this, this trouble, but ultimately until civil society finds a better way to manage this, the environmental cons, we can have the best artificial intelligence the medicine in the world. But I'm from Miami. And when you see what's happening to the ocean in Miami, and you're seeing the climate change, it won't matter how good the computers are in a hospital. There, there won't be a Miami anymore to, 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 to do it. Have to move to have to move to Puerto Alegre. And, and so sort of distributed, connected responsibility. There are sociologists and anthropologists who've written about this. It might be something that we that we can we can expand our collaboration to look at. What is what is accountability? What do accountability and responsibility require of us in this world? When it's credible for everyone to have some, how do you enforce that? How do you educate around that? And what do you do for those people who throw the plastic bottle in the garbage? They do this now. It's at the airport, I'm, I'm so a philosopher. Then when I'm doing research, I'm looking in airports in Miami and Sao Paulo at the recycling and the, and the garbage. And I look in the recycling and I see someone throw garbage. Machines figure that out, or do they? Then they say it all goes to garbage. Does it pollute the whole collection? We can't. After all of this time, we cannot get ordinary people to do something as simple as not put a hamburger wrapper in the plastic container. We can't do that. We don't do. It. When you travel, look at this. People do this everywhere, and and so you have the so as philosophers are talking about strict responsibility when ordinary people. Some of us just don't get it right. That's a social problem. It's a political problem. It's, a, it's an anthropological problem. If you're watching the, uh, the, the, the uh, I don't want to talk about politics, but voters in our countries have, I mean, if you look at the current election in the United States, you will be forgiven for saying, oh my God, not again. <laughs> that's not a political observation. That's an anthropological one. We've, we've discovered the limits of political kookiness. Well, we thought we did, <laughs> uh, but, but neo-fascism is, is still not acceptable, even if a lot of people vote for it. But that, don't get me started. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Professor. Thank you, Professor Goodman, for the brilliant lecture. And uh, while you were speaking about uh, the possible, the eventual consequences of uh, subtracting the human cognitive element from the healthcare system, I was wondering if maybe it's, uh, we, 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 we will eventually um, have to confront a just as huge problem that uh, is the, the, how much more impersonal the healthcare uh, treatment are going to become. We here that are lucky enough to have access to good uh, medical treatments, um, we usually complain about how sometimes we are treated like a, just a piece of equipment in a line of production. We go to the hospitals and they put us uh, in those really uncomfortable clothes, in those um, hospital beds and they take us whatever they want. And our health, and even our here in Brazil, our best health care system, they lack this, um, just stop work, but they lack the, oh. Okay. 
they lack this more personal uh, human aspect that maybe is at the end of the day the only thing that the machine at least in principle you have uh, trouble to stimulating right and i would like to know what are what your thoughts are on how we can best deal with this impersonal aspect of bringing in, in, uh, artificial intelligence to the healthcare system? Well, so our, our portability, huh? I have to press. Uh, uh, oh, sorry. Well, you can hear me without it, yes? So that's a, part of my job at the University of Miami is in the medical school and I teach medical students and we teach our students in Miami and Puerto Alegre we teach them that what doctors and nurses do is fundamentally human has evolved for thousands of years and has created what we believe is the best practice right if you are my medic my doctor I want you to be gentle I want you to be compassionate. I want you to make it easy for me to ask questions because I'm sick and I'm scared and I don't know any medicine, right? We want you to be gentle. We want you to be uh, uh, accommodating. We want you to be human, right? And, and the problem is many medics are not. They, they become, they're busy. They're, 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 there's a lot going on. I mean, a busy practice uh, is someone who's not going to be spending time to have a, a chat with you, a conversation. You're, it's like this all day. And we push against that. We say medicine is inherently human. The relationship between the clinician and the patient is fundamentally human. It is based on a relationship that's shaped by respect, by communication, by understanding, by 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 humanness. And we've already, as people, often failed. Right? So in Miami, at my hospital, some of the doctors there are really, Tanira is wonderful, right? There's a chief medical officer, sometimes we'll do cases together, and she's gentle, she communicates softly, she may, even if she's really busy, she doesn't let you know how busy she is. I have colleagues who want to make sure you know how busy they are. <laughs> I'm going to give you some of my precious time, you know, because I'm so busy. That, that, that's, that's silly. What challenge you raise is how, if the machines have all the time in the world, they can emulate human compassion. They can emulate empathy. Do you care? Once again, imagine uh, we have a very big cancer center. Um, at one extreme, and you can do this online, Google or search for <laughs> nomograms. These are clinical calculators that are on the web that will tell you when you put in your personal information, which you get from your doctor, you're putting your age and, and other things, your diagnosis, certain laboratory values. And this clinical calculator on the web will tell you what your five-year survival rate is, whether you will be dead or alive in five years. Now imagine it's an artificial intelligence program. It's really, really, really accurate. Well, one of the things that was the greatest challenge that I have found teaching medical students is the problem of giving bad news. You're my doctor, you said, Ken, you have metastatic pancreatic cancer. Oh, and also you're this old and you haven't treated it yet. I say, what does that mean? And you say, well, I'm afraid it doesn't look so good. And I'm afraid that 
what you're not telling me is, Ken, you're going to die. <laughs> In the, the relationship between the doctor and the patient, and, and look at what we communicate about, it's difficult. I'm not sure which is, which is more complicated for my students to talk about. Um, it's usually sex, or sex, sexuality and death. Not necessarily in that order. Um, sometimes it's, uh, it's sometimes gastroenterology, right? It's the stuff that we humans tend to not talk about easily very often, but which in a hospital, you need to. If I've got metastatic pancreatic cancer, I'm gonna die. And how you tell me that, how I come to terms with it, when already because of these online calculators, it's now outside your control. Because I'm not waiting for you, doctor, I'm going online. And all these diagnostic and expert systems, and think of it especially in the context of neuroscience and neuroethics uh, with, the, with, with the progressive um, maladies, uh, including uh, Alzheimer's, for example. Patients will not wait for us. So we have a, uh, a I think I sent you the article about the diabetes, the closed right. circuit. I wasn't aware of this. Patients. With diabetes, this is a woman uh, uh, who's a, uh, a student at University of Miami. She's not poor, but, but she has diabetes. They go online and they buy a software patch for a device, which you can buy used or you can have a 3D printer make it, which is connected to a sensor that goes in your body for it's ongoing glucose monitoring but it's also connected to an insulin pump. It's a closed loop artificial pancreas. And the people who use them downloaded from the internet, all of it. She says her blood sugar is controlled with this device better than it was with finger sticks and injections. The manufacturers of these systems now don't want people doing that. They want them to buy their $10,000 system, right? And so to your, to your question, your challenge, and it goes to yours as well, that responsibility. Sometimes patients are taking responsibility and they're prepared to say, if anything goes wrong, I understood it's on me. But from something as common as diabetes to death, to what's a dying from a cancer, um, what, and I, I, once again, I'm particularly excited about this in the, in the realm of neuroethics or neuroscience. Our, 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 we, our students, our friends, our family will not wait for the next technology. And so you have this really interesting decentralization of power. People are really making their own batteries. It becomes, it becomes a very, very interesting world where stuff that works that's high technology becomes available. No, not, not in poor countries, but certainly in, in Brazil and the United States. And then what? Should that be regulated? What do the patients say? I don't want you to regulate it. I, as soon as you regulate it, I can't afford it. I don't know what I want to say about that. But, but your challenge is one of the two of you opposed what I think is just an exquisitely focused example of the challenge we face. This technology might be different than any previous technology. Because unlike the stethoscope, which helps me hear, or the otoscope, which helps me see, or the hammer, which helps, this is helping me think. And before the tools were not very good. It was a slide rule, it was a calculator. But now it's at your desk and in your hand, a machine that is scraping the entire internet and giving you an answer like that. I don't I, the, 
it, it, is, it is a teaching moment for all of us. I'm just convinced that philosophers need to be in charge. Great question. Thank you. Thank you. Questions? Yes. Please. Oh, good morning. My name is Amin. And I'm thinking about, well, it seems like the smoke is in the governability uh, um, aspect. And I read an article. Uh, it, it was saying that to have responsibility and to be accountable for, for something, and including the field of AI, you should be part of it. So if, if people, they're different from the people in the power, they're not building it, they're not gonna be res feel responsible for it and they're not gonna feel like they should be account accountable for it. And I actually agree. And uh, the writer, Kaluri from Stanford College, she said that, the university, she said that, um, it's not a matter of asking um, how good or bad AI is, but it is a matter of saying how it shifts power. And I wanna hear your considerations about it. Do you, do you, uh, there was a, a uh, scholar at, I want to say he was at MIT, a man named Richard Stallman. He was part of the free software movement and believed that all software, all software should be free. And what he and, and, and his colleagues did was they wrote really good software. And you can use this software now. It's run on a Unix system. It's a word. It's, it's not. It's not. You buy a. Buy, this computer is a Dell computer, so it's got Microsoft software on it, and you've got to use that. Computer programs that he wrote, including the word processors, don't run on DOS or the versions that Microsoft has now patented. Runs on an open source. In other words, what he argued is we should all take responsible. If we wait for Microsoft and Google and Siemens and, and them, it will wait for a very, very long time. But ultimately, the people, when they take responsibility and write their own software, this is free software that's really good. Is it easy to share documents? Yeah, there's a whole parallel work, but the, it's called, uh, uh, it's, it's a version of Unix that you can use. Um, but there are lots of free open source versions of software that do everything you do. Well, it doesn't come with the computer that you bought. When the university buys it, they want the guarantee, the three-year contract to fix the parts. So, and it's sort of like recycling. I could have learned to use this other software. I could have gotten the free version and uploaded it and managed it. But I just like calling tech support. Those human failings, I listed some of them, greed, laziness. Um, I'm, 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 I'm a, in my heart of hearts, I'm not that virtuous. I'm not that virtuous. And I don't know, therefore, what's to be done about the world. But I know that I, in the course of my day, knowing what I know about climate change, I am contributing on a regular basis with my lifestyle. Are you a vegetarian? No. Are you a vegetarian? Oh, good. Okay. Are you? No. So you're the only one who's getting it right because you know the environmental cost of meat. If we all really cared about this enough, stop eating meat tomorrow. What chance do you think that Brazilians and Americans are going to stop eating meat? Not bloody likely. <laughs> so, but what we're also seeing evolving is new kinds of relationships. And to make it a positive point, because like ultimately I want, I don't think the world is going to end. Uh, I want to believe that human creativity and human intelligence will actually teach the robots how to do this correctly because it will involve human values it will involve human communication it will involve how we talk to each other and respect each other and and that, and that whether or not a machine can fake it or not will not be the most important question it's what is what they're asking now it's what 
that colleagues in medicine and law enforcement and elsewhere are asking is, can the machine fake it? I think those of us with goodwill will say, we don't care whether it can or not. We want humans to be empowered to make the optimal use of these intelligent machines. And we will. If the, gov if the, com if the companies won't do it and the governments won't do it, then the universities will. The universities won't. Because our, our universities they face exactly the same problem. I can tell you right now, the University of Miami and folks have exactly the same problem. You know what it is? It's money. It's all. If we all had a bunch more money, all of our problems would be solved. And so that guides our decision making right there. And, 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 and the need for money engenders um, making exceptions. And it makes it on a large scale. We call that corruption, right? And so, and so uh, in the United States, you're seeing, uh, the city of Miami is a great example of people breaking the rules for the sake of money. I'll kill surprise, <laughs> right? I mean, what, what, why do people do that? The answer is because we're human and we keep doing that. We keep throwing the cup with ice in the bin that was for plastic recycling bottles. It wasn't complicated and we can't get it wrong. On Tuesday of, of the second of October, third instant of 2020, we're going to solve climate change and robots with brains that are better than ours. We got to get our act together is what we need to do and think of creative new ways to frame responsibility that don't let me sneak off. Having said, I'm committed to this and then go off and do something else. But, but we have become used to our own hypocrisy. I listen to myself all the time. I sound, what a swell guy. He's talking about climate change, justice, poverty. What's he doing? I say, well, I pay taxes. I pay for a lot. I have a button that says raise my taxes. I believe in taxes. I like to pay taxes. I really do. Because the difference between that and others in the collapse of civilization. You know, in, in, in Miami, in America, we call these libertarians. Libertarians, which basically it's all about my liberty. My liberty. But the philosophers will tell you that liberty without responsibility is, is parasitism. It can't simply be liberty. Liberty is great. I love it. I want to have free speech. I want to listen to I want music. I want books. And I want all of that. In Florida, the libertarians outlaw certain books you understand in schools. So yes, liberty matters a lot, but social liberty does not mean there's no responsibility either. And that's what uh, 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 I, I wish the anarchists were right. I mean, we need somebody to coordinate this and make sure the roads are paved. And every once in a while, we need a peace officer. I like the phrase peace officer, not police officer, right? It sounds better. Uh, we have problems with even police officers. But that's the hope, and that's the goal, is that we will think of responsibility in a way that let us do our duty without it being ruinous, without it being offensive, without it being too much to do. Ordinary people need to take responsibility here as well as corporations and governments. And, and we will evolve because we're creative humans, new ways of thinking about that, but responsibility and justice that, that follow from it. Great question. Well, thank you, Professor Ken Goodman, once again, for his brilliant talk and uh, the very uh, and discussion and just to remind you guys tomorrow and uh, Thursday we have two more talks tomorrow at the uh, hospital main auditorium uh, auditorium de Irmão José Otão 1130 11 e 30 e quinta no INSEC Instituto do Cérebro the Brain Institute at 11 a.m. thank you very much Thank you.